Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well over here. How are you doing over there? I have to ask. Uh, doing good. Uh, I, I, I think this is really going to revolve around the holiday season as I am languishing in it myself uh, right now. I don't go back to, to work till Monday. Uh, so I've been tinkering around with, with stuff, really, you know, waking up uh, whenever I feel like uh, and then coming in here and, and really not doing anything uh, super intense, although the Archimpose developments would would call that a lie. Uh, but the, the the things I've been working on recently have been uh, like upgrades to my tooling. Like I've been working on uh, NeoVim, uh, and th- and there've been some like big things that I don't want to get to, uh, like the uh, the uh, autocomplete for Ansible, uh, the the Ansible language server uh, is is busted because it's returning something. The language ser- server is returning something that the autocomplete engine is not expecting. Like it's returning a blank string before it returns the completion, and the the completion engine is throwing the blank string in there, and then it loses all the completion because it it's now trying to complete it's, a blank string. It's like yeah, all right. Uh, so so I, I I opened up that. Um, incident on on GitHub and, and I'm working with the maintainers on that. Um, I was also going through trying to figure out how to add snippets to NeoVim, right, and how to take advantage of snippets and how to set up because I have like the engine and stuff ready to go. Like I can see the snippets as an option, but like how do I go, you know, next and previous and put it in and say I want to accept the default on this one and you know just just getting the muscle memory down uh, for that um and then so i have to ask you with snippets what snippets are you using what do those look like well, for you do so you have like a set that you have i i have templates that i use on a lot of what i write so on python scripts for instance my if name equals main function looks the same yeah. on every script i write okay right? yeah cuz i i call the main function if after the if name equals main but it's couched in a a try accept statement to catch a um an interrupt, interrupt. signal yeah. yeah so that is five lines of code that i hope to never have to type again uh, because it's it's the same thing over and over again sure. now snippets you can also put variables in there and you can do like fancy things and you can do snippets inside of snippets and like there's this whole whatever but i'm just trying to get that muscle memory, you know, and, and I hope to this, this week as well, touch on some of the find and replace stuff. Um, specifically far.vim has, you know, far, far, find and replace far.vim. Um, and, and be able to do that because like one of the cool things I see in VS code all the time is like, if you change the name of a function or a variable, uh, in, in a function, the way it's called, it'll change it in all instances. So it'll change every time you call that function, it'll change it to the new name. Like that would be a really handy feature. So I don't have to, you know, miss one. Go and through. It's like, yeah, right. No such function. I was like, ah, I renamed it, you know. So uh, the, I, I do have like fuzzy search set up um, with FCF uh, and uh, the Rust, Rust grep RG. Um, so there's there's stuff I have already in there that I'm using currently, but kind of bringing that all together and adding this other plugin on top of it to to give me that additional functionality. So just just kind of a meet and greet for my tools and and saying hi, this is how you use us. Here's the muscle memory that you need to to do and and what I, what I need to get those those set up. Uh, and I think that's a, a great transition into our first article here about. Uh, minimum viable action, right? Because I, I have all these things. I've, I've gone through the rest of my NeoVim setup as I've been obviously talking over the past couple of months about doing that. But like, these are the bigger things that I kept pushing off and I kept, kept saying like, eh, I, these, these, these are going to be a pain. Like, I, I know these are going to be a pain. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. And specifically last night, I sat down to figure out the... The adding a new snippet because I wanted to add a new one for uh, an, an Ansible play because I always start out the Ansible play the same you know with the the hosts the become line um, the vars prompt and and the tasks right so I figure I can I can have all those like one of the things I want to figure out in that 
is can I have it so that uh, it will give me the option to include the vars prompt, but if I don't need that, then I can exclude it, like with a keystroke or something. Is is that a possibility? I don't know, because I hadn't got there yet. <laughs> so that is that is yet to come. And, and it's yet to come because I, I just took the minimum viable action, right, um, to, to get that task started. Because it, it, is, it was something that, you know, I, I didn't necessarily want to, um, want to tackle all at once, right? So uh, in, in this article here, when they're talking about minimum viable action, they, they define it here, right? Um, so it says, sometimes tasks are difficult to start because we don't know if some actions would benefit the task or hurt it. You know, we have the same problem using um, minimum viable products and minimum viable tests, right? So doing like blue green testing, you know, or, or, or doing um, minimum viable products, rolling out new new features. Um, so, so taking the MVA, which is the minimum viable action, uh, in these cases can offer us confirmation that the style of action makes sense, right? So, so my minimum viable action here was I need a way to work with snippets, right? And I have this whole framework uh, set up to do this, uh, and I, I did uh, research, right? I mean, my first step was to do research. What works with LSP snippets, right? Um, what works with, you know, how, how can I add snippets? Do I have a curated list of, of commonly accepted snippets available to me so my code looks more familiar to other people who may be looking at, so it's not, you know, my own idioms that I'm writing. Right, right. So, so that was, you know, step, step number one. And, and really that is all I had done up till yesterday, right? That was the first step I took on that. Uh, and then, then I set that task aside. I was like, look, I've, I, I did one step and now I get to do another when I pick that back up. Okay. How about that? So when I read this, I, it reminded me of something I read a while back, which was, it was kind of like a, a guide to being lazy, right? You do the one thing. If you don't want to do it, or it was a guide on procrastination. It was uh, mm -hmm. if you don't want to do it, do the the least amount you elite, least amount possible, which is kind of what you were describing. Exactly. But then it went to say, and kind of how this article kind of prescribes it. It's like, well, once you have the document or configuration open, now that you're in it, you may as well just stay for like one or two more tasks, yeah, which they, I really liked, and that always kind of suckers me into that. I yeah. always get kind of tricked into that. I trick myself into, all right, well, I'm just going to add one, you know, right, one fetch line to this API. It doesn't even, you don't even have to do the back end part of it. Just do the, the front end, just make their call to what endpoint you need. Sure enough, you know, I'm halfway through the entire task going, oh, well, now I'm all the way in the back end doing who fixing something else right now. Always, always ends up happening to me, but I really like how they, the article just kind of described that. I don't know if you wanted to, talk on it more describe how the flow basically that kind of works yeah because that is and they actually even hyperlink it here it's it's a jedi mind trick they they call it now, i don't know if anyone doesn't know what a jedi mind trick is but if you don't there's a hyperlink that explains it for you the the the, the thought behind that is how do we think about motivation you know is is motivation we just sit around patiently something we just sit around patiently waiting for and say okay motivation i'm ready for you to hit me now right that's <laughs> that's 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 not what we're, we're 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 looking for here um uh there is i i forget if it was gk chesterton or c.s lewis uh but someone uh someone back someone dead by now probably uh, had had a really good quote about christianity uh and and they said only the only the faithful obey and only the obedient believe right and, and so it's it's this chicken and the egg problem that you see with with motivation right motivation isn't something that hits you out of nowhere right it's something that will dedicate your dedication kickstarts right sometimes you don't you don't feel like something right and and it's that initial inertia that you need to figure out how to get which will spark the landslide effect where, where the rest of it just, just starts happening. And, and sometimes it doesn't, right? Sometimes I literally sit down and like that other article that you were talking about, sometimes I literally just sit down for five minutes and then I, I do the one thing and I'm like, look, I've spent five minutes on this. I did it. I, yeah. I, I have no you know inclination about staying and doing this anymore. I'm going to move on to the next thing because this is just the worst thing in the world right now. So, so, so I do. So I move on. But that, that initial kick 
uh, is is very very important. And and this is this is a way to to think of it as its initial kick. I mean they they uh, call it a quantum action here uh, instead because they they talk about um, uh, the quantum mechanics and physics uh, talks about quantum as a minimal amount of physical property involved in any interaction. Uh, so they, they postulate calling this quantum action instead. So like what's what's the smallest amount of action uh, that you can do on a task, right? And and this is where you come to say there, there may be two or three things I have in progress right now. And it's not because um, I'm, I'm scatterbrained or it's not because I can't, can't sit on something. It's because in the back of my head, I, I'm not ready to do this. My, I, I haven't been able to ruminate on it. I haven't been able to, you know, sleep on it is an old phrase that a lot of people use. But, like, the ability just to let your brain just kind of put the pieces Process together it, in the yeah, background. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's, a, that's a real thing. So if you don't, you know, if, if you're feeling some kind of a, a hesitancy, a hesitancy towards that, right? It, 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 there's probably a good reason. It's probably because you don't have a clear uh, direction of where you want to go, or 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 really a, a next step defined, right? So, uh, some of those things you can you can help, uh, like, like like sitting down and, and writing writing out what you need to do to get that task done if if it's something you're stuck on. But more than likely, you just need to dive into it, uh, and then and then let it take you where it will. Now don't let it become scope creep. And that's, that's kind of the other end of the spectrum. So, so on the spectrum here, you have the initial inertia, you have the, the, the quantum action, right? And then on the other hand, you have scope creep, right? And your work should be a constant balance between the two of those, right? Are you able to get started on the thing? And you're, are you able to like not do too let much? Let it of go. One thing? Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So how do you stay in that, that happy medium? Um, it's a, it's not an easy, uh, balance to strike, uh, but but this is this is certainly focusing on one side of that and saying, hey, you, you do need that that initial kick, right? You need that kick, uh, and then your motivation will will kick and say, oh, y- I'm good at this. I forgot how good I was at this. I'm I'm exactly. excellent at this. Yeah. yeah. Let me let me sh- yeah. you know th- let me let me display my excellence and and then then you 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 have the ball rolling there. So um, that's basically I, I and, and that's literally what I did with with NeoVimp the other day. I I, I sat down. I was like. Let me just like see what snippets I can use right now, and then ended up filing a different GitHub issue because I, I went went way down in the weeds there. But that was that was that was fun as well. We also have the other article here. Yeah, you want to touch wanna... on that one? That one was on self-hosting. I'll tell you what, I was more familiar with the MVA, but I can talk on this one as well. And I really liked this one, which kind of discussed. I don't know if you want to call it the movement or. Was it an opinion article, would you say, about moving away from big tech companies? Just kind of describing this world where I think we already are, we already live in, of self-hosting. Where So basically, just kind of dives into what it looks like self-hosting, hosting your own services. It kind of talks on a couple people. Actually, I think it was one guy who set up a Raspberry Pi because he wanted to do file sharing. And he was tired of getting burned by you know Dropbox, Google Photos and a handful of these other platforms just said, all right, I'm doing this at my house. I'm doing it for myself and for my friends and went off. And he, now he's hosting all these services for, it sounds like a handful of people. Yeah. That was, that was the author, John, um, he, that he was, he was talking about, he was able to, to set up a sync thing, uh, where he, yeah. he kind of dove into the rest of it through that. Um, they, they talked to a mod at, at the self-hosted subreddit. Um, which is always a great, great uh, resource um, for for anything self-hosted. Um, as well, they also talked to the co-creator of the awesome self-hosted list, which is literally the first place I check for. Hey, I wonder if there's a way to self-host this type of service, like a CRM yeah. or you know, uh, a- a- accounting software or you know, and any any type of thing that that we would be able to to incorporate into our compose would be something that you're more than likely going to find on that list. So that's that's really cool that that uh, John was able to sit down uh, with Edward to, to go over that. The the thing I picked up now, there were there were two things here. Right above the uh, the picture of uh, John's Raspberry Pi uh, and and the. Uh, external storage that he has there uh, yeah. was a, a paragraph that touched on 
Um, touch on an interesting point. He said, self-hosting is something I found fun to learn about and tinker with, even if it is just for myself. Uh, the, the moderator of uh, our self-hosted said, eventually a career path started with it, and from there, being in the community professionally kept me personally interested as a hobby. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to play around in a personal uh, type of environment. Now, that belies a, a bit of a mentality towards this being what you do. Like, you're, you're the self-hosted guy, right? This isn't a, a approach that people can just take. Jump into. Yeah. Sure. Th- I mean, you, you can. Um, it, it, you don't need, like, an authority to tell you, you know, you No, you may, right, or you you're allowed to do this. Right. Um, but, but this is certainly not something that I think people who are unfamiliar with the command line say are going to be interested in. Uh, now there are, there, there's another paragraph at the, the bottom of here uh, that, that starts off the quality of free and easy to use self-hosting software has increased too, making the practice increasingly accessible to the less technically savvy. And that is, that is a off repeated talking point that I think is a bit intellectually dishonest, right? It's not that people are less technically savvy. It's that people have more to their life than self-hosting their services, right? The reason they're self-hosting their services is because they want to do other things with those services. Right. Sure, it can be your playground. It could be where you you tinker and, and, and do things if you are technically savvy. Um, but even if you are technically savvy, there are some things I just want to set and forget about. Like, totally. like my, my, my NAS here, right? I set that and I just forget about it because it stores my data. I make sure that if anything happens, I get alerted or whatever, but I'm not like poking and prodding it every week. Sure. Right. And this, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you're not doing that because that, <laughs> that just sounds like a recipe for a nightmare right there. <laughs> exactly. your NAS every week. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, that would be, that would be, that would be an indicator that something is not going right. Right. That, that software is not as stable as it should be or, or, or it's, you know, not performance or it's, it's causing issues. Right. The reason I have to reach into something is either A, I want something better or B, I want it to work the way it did when it was working. So this, this less technically savvy bit is the only bit in that sentence that I, I take issue with um, because I, I do think it makes it incredibly accessible to a broader array of even technically savvy folks like us because now we get to play around with, with all these different types of things that w- – I couldn't, I, I don't have the time to compile from source. I don't have this time to set up system D services and, and timers right. and, you know, the, the entire infrastructure uh, behind it. You know, Docker's made that, that increasingly easy. Uh, the, just, just all of the automation tooling, you know, we, we like Ansible, right? And, and, and that's made it reproducible. Right. And I was going to say, it's not the, it's not just the services, right? It's the infrastructure around it. So as you're mentioning these, it's not just, I want to deploy a password manager or I want to deploy a file hosting service. It's, I want to do these, but I need a repeatable way to do them. And I want to be able to do them in a way that, all right, the application separated from the data in a way that I can just easily upgrade applications now. Yeah. So it's, self-hosted i i don't know if it's the self-hosted community that i said would or that i say would bring this all the way forward but there's definitely been that movement where technically and i'd say more technically inclined people can pick it up and just kind of set and for set and forget they don't have to tinker with it if they don't want to yeah and it's it it can it can never be closed source successfully right it can be closed source temporarily um, you know, because because you can get a, a a good speed boost out of closed sourcing it and just hacking away and 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 doing really bad, you know, just just workarounds, you know. But but if you want to do something the right way, if you want to do something the ethical way, the sustainable way, I mean, the, this is this is the only type of community that you're gonna be able to get the broad. Uh, experimentation with the, the 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 tinkers are the people who do just want to spin it up and say hey just spinning it up didn't work right 
well, what, what, you know, why not? You know, what, what, what do you, what are you running into and, and, and working with that and, and making it better, continuing to make it better. And I do like in the article here, they have, you know, several times over, they, they kind of enumerate, not, not explicitly, but, but the reasons why people self-host, right? There, there are many, uh, you know, reasons why you would do this from technical interest uh, fr- to a security and privacy perspective, the ability to customize stuff, having control of the software, being self-reliant, looking for a challenge, um, economical reasons, saving the money, you know, um, free software activism or, or, or political reasons, right? There are many, many different reasons why you do that and, and bringing all those people under one umbrella and saying, hey, I have an open source software in, in which for you to, or for, for you to to try out for you to to use if if this is the solution to your problem and if it's not the solution to your problem right then what problem are you having so we can help you get to a solution right and and that's something that's going to be worth creating right that is something that is going to continue to get better and that's going to be sustainable and and we're looking to to serve that market as many other projects are Right, I'm. I'm not going to lie and say we're the only ones who've who've thought of bringing right. some of these projects under one roof. Totally. Right? I I think we got a a good way to do this, right? A, a sustainable way to do this. Um, and I am married to the idea of doing it the right way, right? Doing it the ethical way. And I agree with that. I I t- I'll tell you what we do have. Along those same lines of doing it the ethical way here, we do have a handful of uh, news and community updates from a couple projects around the ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to skip the sweet CRM one. Nothing huge coming out of that. Uh, Just some maintenance patches. Uh, We do have, though, kind of some other updates. Uh, I'm Mm going to jump to Firefly 3 here. Yep. The CSV importer, it's the last release for this they're migrating away so this is their 3.0.0 it was released two days ago if you look there's a warning i'm saying it now don't be surprised when you can't import data via csv the warning is this is the last release of the csv importer the firefly 3 data importer will replace the csv importer so okay so there is a replacement in there's a replacement available but the csv importer is being deprecated no longer worked on unmaintained i'm sure if there is a security patch, they may go back, but yep, who knows? Has to be yep. reported, right? Uh, the next one, another small one, is the CAN board update. Again, with this one, it looks like they're just kind of doing regular maintenance. Uh, a lot of the libraries, it looks like, were upgraded. Uh, and then Composer, which I think is a PHP. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. Laravel or Package Manager or what Composer is, but uh, Composer is updated. And then... I, we I don't know if we, we touched on it last week I believe, uh, but Rundeck had some log4j vulnerabilities, so that warranted a new a couple new releases uh, in the 3.4.x branch and the 3.3.x branch, and I think with the 3.4.9 we got a new release, Papadum Gold Globe, which really just kind of covers. Uh, the log4j vulnerability as Rundeck is in fact a Java application. Yep. And uh, the 3.3.17 was released, which we are currently pegging since that's one minor version behind latest. Uh, and uh, that seems to be working all right. We upgraded our own infrastructure uh, to reflect that and, and uh, everything's going smoothly from our end. And then the last one here is from Bookstack, which I don't know if you got a chance to look at this update, but there was a quite a lot going on in this one. Uh, so I was expecting another vulnerability update, kind mm-hmm. of uh, just expecting smaller updates, just kind of waiting to see, all right, what's what's going on. But this 21.12 includes quite a few new features, including outgoing webhooks, which is Awesome. I always love seeing webhooks now. Yeah, I don't know exactly what you're going to use webhooks on documentation for, but hey, they're available. You can see when 
pages are created, create alerts around that, which is great to see. I, I love myself a good webhook, honestly. <laughs> um, you're able to copy entire chapters and books. If you look at the next paragraph here, they, they Dan kind of explains that. He says, these new abilities bring some great potential new workflow advancements, such as being able to create templated books, pre-configured nice. with the right chapter and page structure, ready to be copied out, which is what and that's we were awesome. doing manually. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, we, yeah. we started out with that. We said, you know, all of our books, we want to have these chapters and then we want to have the the upstream links page uh, in the, the 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 last chapter. So having if we were able to do that earlier, that would have saved me probably two or three hours. A lot of time, yeah. Manually, you know, putting in all these going through and creating. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, that that is really cool to see. That is an actual problem that I had that I had to perform a workaround for that he's introduced a a advancement for. So that's that's great. That's an awesome one. We'll have to get a template created out there. Yeah. Sounds like a task. But uh, moving forward here, the there is copy rules as well, which kind of follows that same, uh, what I would call same same kind of line right there, right? You have a user. You want to give them, all right, is this an editor? Is this someone we want to give read-only access to behind visible pages, behind pages that aren't visible to the public? So kind of along the same lines with that one. Uh, but for roles of users. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is the search API updates. Uh, in 21.11, they mentioned the search API endpoint, and it sounds like it's just continuing to update this API endpoint for more, just more additions, more useful response uh, data in the response. And then the last one is uh, a logical theme system, custom commands. I don't have anything on that one. It sounds like just an easier way to manage themes. There is a YouTube video attached with this one. Uh, also, I'll give Dan the plug that he does have the YouTube channel, which it sounds like he's going full force on out there. Good for so, him. That is all I have. There is a full list of changes on that one, and we do have all the... News and community updates, as always, on the show notes. Do we want to jump into our composed developments here? Sure. So, once again, breaking this down by our pillars for Q4, uh, let's start with some instance features. Uh, so, Jack, I'm actually going to come right back to you and ask you about portal application views for logs. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, now, since we're starting to split out each application in portal with available functionality, what the status is, what the functions you're going to have available uh, with that service. Right now we have the ability and we, I'll, I'll say we had it there. Uh, we had it for everything, which was okay. It showed up all in one page. Now we have it split down by application, basically, what application is this? Okay, it's Nextcloud. All right, we're only going to show you the Nextcloud logs instead of showing you every single log, right? We don't want to show you portal logs with the Nextcloud application, right? You don't want to see that. So uh, with this feature, it, it, it's a small one. I, I know people aren't probably aren't dying to just jump through Nginx logs, but in fact, they are now available on uh, each individual application in, within portal. So kind of kind of exciting one, a smaller development, but your logs are available if you would like to see them. That is all I have for that one. Did you want to talk on Jekyll here? Sure, Any? yeah. So we got we got plenty more coming up here. So the the first one is going to be the Jekyll full site bind map points. Uh, and that is saying that uh, since Jekyll g generates a static site, uh, so that's all of the HTML pages without any kind of uh, stuff that needs to be done on, on server side. Uh, this should be something that a simple web server should be able to deliver, right? So we have the proxy in front of all of our services and previously had been reaching back to the Jekyll server as it ran Jekyll serve to grab the, the pages, um, that it needed. Now, um, that is that is more useful for developing a site as you you serve the site on a live basis, uh, and that allows anyone who is uh, developing it to see the 
the the live reload right as as you go through and hit it like a, a regular web page well you don't need that redirection for a static site once it's generated the difficulty was uh, getting the generated files um, bind mounted into the nginx container uh, and that's because it wasn't on one of the underlying Jekyll, uh, not volumes, what are, what are they called? Uh, layers um, in, in, in the Docker container, right? It was on the topped uh, merge directory uh, because that was generated at runtime. So we had to figure out how to do that. What we ended up doing is putting it in a uh, bind mount and a volume under the, the serve directory and bind mounting that serve directory into uh, Nginx. So that is now getting uh, bind mounted into the proxy uh, and that should deliver the web page much, much quicker uh, than than going back and, and hitting the, the Jekyll server. Actual, as, yeah. Having that render and, and, and bring it back. There's a, there was just no reason for that other than we hadn't gotten around to, to doing this yet. Uh, and the reason I got into doing that was because I was testing the next thing, uh, which is rebooting the instance. And yes, this does sound trivial but like the way we run especially the bind mount points but a couple other things uh, the the reboot of a server would actually not cause it to come up correctly right so the obvious fix to that was okay let's make it come up correctly how do you do that though and and really what we have set up is is a r compose startup script uh, that gets call, called every reboot by an R Compose startup system D service file, and that will uh, imitate a run composition rule, right? It, it does have to grab a couple of details from uh, the containers, whether they're spun down or not. They're still going to have those detailer details if we do a Docker inspect on them, uh, and then some other things from the environment too. So it'll it'll pull those. It'll run as appropriate. Uh, there were also some other edits to make, like the ability to uh, skip certain tasks. Like one of the tasks in Portal is to not restart Portal if commands receivable is running. Because if commands receivable is running, the Portal task actually restarts it. So then that would restart whatever, it would report a failure, and, and we'd have a failure in the logs rather than a successful run. So it just waits for commands receivable to complete before continuing on with the, the portal task. Well, if it's running inside of commands receivable, it will never continue Run, right. because it's waiting right. for itself to stop, which is right. asinine. So the ability to skip that task and, and force it and say, you know what, actually, yeah, I do want you to kick it uh, so that we can get on with the program here. That'd be great uh, because we don't necessarily need it. We're not calling it from portal uh, as, as we would expect to. We're actually calling from the... The, the instance itself and we know portals already going to be broken so I don't care if it you know I, I don't I don't care if we, we bring it down um, temporarily so let's let's go ahead and, and, and kick it um, so there were other factors in there that we had to consider uh, when rebooting the the instance kind of just putting all the puzzle pieces together um, and and a lot of underlying uh, Unix, Linux operating system knowledge needed to kind of say what's going to be available to me, what's not, what can I utilize. Uh, so that was that was a fun exercise for me, I think, uh, in, just, in just architecting it so that it was resilient, so that it made sense uh, in, in the paradigm that we try to operate within. Uh, next was the Rundeck log4j remediation. So we already touched on that. Uh, we updated our infrastructure to to uh, 3.3.17, um, which remediated the log4j vulnerabilities, at least the ones, the remediations that have been published thus far. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, for uh, the administrative pillar uh, that we are attacking here, uh, we revamped how Portal, at least, and Command Center um, soon uh, does its branching so that we're able to cherry pick bug fixes rather than have a just ongoing latest and greatest is yeah, stable. Uh, totally. I, how do you want to describe that? Uh, what's that workflow? I know there's a specific workflow. That's Is that feature branching? Do you want to touch on that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, I, we've, we've already gone that? over it. Uh, I think it was... Okay. 
early on. It was probably episode two or three or four or something like that. Uh, but we did discuss the GitLab workflow and how that worked and, and how feature branches work um, and how stable branches worked uh, with with the ability to backport bug fixes across major versions yeah. uh, so that we can have multiple versions supported and up to date without having to clobber one thing or another, uh, which is what we were running into with, with Portal because we'd push something for a fix for something and then it would have an issue with something else because it was latest and greatest and we we're trying to fix this just running one off thing of it, right, back in the right. yeah so so our ability to maintain those stable branches um and and tags is going to help a lot but the the we we do use a lot of those those branches and stuff um when we're we're doing our deploys i mean that's that's part of uh one of the variables right that that we're able to select uh when we put the stuff together Right and and uh, we've been able to do it through through run deck and and the ability to pass it to the instance and have the instance pass it back as we're doing this complicated. I I, I was talking about architecting this stuff before, uh, you know, in in the paradigm that that our compose tries to to uh, fit itself inside. Right, we've we've kind of set the boundaries for ourselves and we say it should work with all of these things, right? So we've done this this really cool work on, you know, being able to reboot the instance, call uh, run our compose rules on itself and 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 all these cool things locally on the instance, but we can't forget about using Rundeck as our automation front end, right? That's that's super handy when it comes to injecting some of the compositional enterprise infrastructure secrets into the runs that we we perform um, on on these instances especially the ones that we maintain right um, so what Jack's done for a lot of these things that we've been talking about is he's been writing equivalent API calls out to run deck to to have it run what we need it to run on the instance if it's in the compositional enterprises infrastructure rather than having it run locally on itself. So I'm gonna let Jack talk. Um, today he wants to talk about the the API of Rundeck and how he's used that to accomplish this this dichotomy of stuff being able to run locally, but also how do we how do we call Rundeck so that we can have credentials, so we can have secrets and stuff in our maintained infrastructure absolutely and what an intro uh, what an intro uh wow so i'm gonna be pretty short here and quick on this api section but a lot of what andrew said is basically he covered it very well and i kind of want to go into more details on it but essentially what we have is on every portal instance we're making calls to either the local instance as you mentioned or to out to run deck so if you're on our infrastructure you can run most of your jobs from the local instance or you can make a call out to run deck and run deck will run that from there and what we end up doing is injecting a bunch of keys in and passwords in and all this fun stuff for portals to say to itself okay look i'm able to make calls out to run deck i'm able to do run jobs from basically a shared infrastructure rather than my own so i don't have to die and you know kill my resource usage every time now what it ends up doing is of course it's going to go you know when we say we're going to run a compositional role it's going to act on that instance but we're calling ansible not from the c commands receivable on the local instance we're calling it from the run deck api which is in fact running it from itself out to the instance but you have to ask yourself what's this api what's an api i don't know how technically inclined most of our user base is uh but with us talking about non-technically savvy earlier basically an api is uh, a funny word for application programming interface it essentially means i don't have to point and click through the run deck application i i can just write in code hey i want to make a call out to this endpoint which will will do this and the most popular are obviously going to be jobs executions projects but to get started with the api it starts at authentication you have to who are you right and we talked about ecls last week and user authentication last week who are you are you allowed to run this right and you can write a whole front end if you want and that's essentially what we've done with portal for run deck instead of giving out local accounts for our run deck instance and 
an ACL policy on those users, that's probably just going to be monstrous. What we've done is we've taken Portal and said, hey, look, you're going to be able to run certain jobs, certain executions from your instance, but I made it, <laughs> we made it easy for you by putting it a, a, a nice UI you know, a nice user interface in front of the API saying, hey, look, we want you to be able to read, you know, if you're having issues, we want you to be able to run in our Compose instance. We want you to be able to restart a service. We want you to be able to stop a service now we, Now that we have that available. We want you to make, you know, we want to allow you to remove services, add services, whatever you want to do, that's fine. But I'm going to make it easy for you rather than just making, you know, handing you run deck information saying, hey, here you go. I'm going to make it easy and say, hey, look, here's your simple navigation. Let me just add it in portal and you can walk, you can walk through it the way you want. Right. Yeah. And instead of saying you have to go to our infrastructure and log into this totally separate service with totally different username and password. Right. We're going to let you do your thing on your server and you can use our infrastructure. And uh, that's done via an API token. Now to get a little bit technically savvy, cause I, I am personally interested in this. So like, Rundeck uses an API token rather than regular auth, like a username and password. Right. That's correct. So I really like that, the token aspect of it, because you have to log in to get your token, right? And I won't get picky, but you can do it from the API if you have that access to create authentication tokens. But I don't want to dive into that right now. Uh, essentially, what you have to do is log in. And then, so it authenticates. Well, to, says, "All right, to to, here, to here cut you, you off at the pass there. Yeah, like we're not doing this, and we're not asking really anyone to do this. Correct? What do you mean, create authentication tokens? Correct. No, what I've included here in okay. the API is how we we have it. So even when you rotate keys, which you've done, we've done that. What that looks like for us is." essentially what I'm going to walk through here, right? No one has to walk. This authentication stuff I included is nice if you you yourself want to use the API. If you want to sign up and for your instance, if you run deck as a service you selected and you want to do kind of this front end automation, you want developers to have an API available to them, You this is how you would grant them access without giving them full admin. Now, most instances, if you give them that password, please don't share that. Uh, they, this is how they would, in fact, get a token. But the authentication's done. You sign in, you hit your profile, and then in your instance, there's a little user API token with a plus next to it. And then what it's going to do is a little module is going to pop up and it's going to say generate new token. You get to name it. You have to assign the username associated with that token. So you can, in fact, create them for other users. Now, if you're an admin, you can only create it for admin and below. If you only have if you don't have an ACL attached with your user for access to the API, you're not going to be able to create it for this, which I have in fact tested. Um, but under the user is where you get the roles. And that's where kind of your ACLs come into play. That's where you get to say, hey, what 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 does this user need? And so what Andrew and I have is with the ACL, you can select basically for us, you select the project, the jobs, and then what I'll say what uh, I hate to say access again, what what permissions, permissions you have on that job, essentially. So you can, uh, and this is where I put CRUD, create, update, read, and destroy. Uh, so those are kind of the four rules per se. So what we have, now the ACLs go, you can run jobs and there's I think six or seven, but with the rules, what you're able to do is as that user, you create your token, you assign yourself. So we have the read run rule, which we have on every instance, rather than giving our, <laughs> rather than giving our portal instances, admin rights to every single instance and just waiting for someone to just pop the server. We've given them just read run on a handful of jobs across quite in fact, just one project as I have learned now and run into issues with. Uh, and then at the bottom there, you have the expiration time, which you can set to delay. So we have ours at 45 days. So after 45 days, you will never see this on your instance. For us, we rotate keys. It's just good practice. It's something we do kind of out of the box. 
we rotate keys every 45 days at the 30 day mark is when we rotate them. So something just to keep in mind as you create these API keys, because you really, <laughs> please don't go in and just set a null date. <laughs> Let it just go forever. That's just not good. Now it's you, not like anyone's going to get it, but just yeah, please and, don't do that. And you can't go in and, and manage them. You can't go in and delete them or, or, or change them if you need to. But I mean, it's, that's, that's going to be best, best hygiene right is is create with the uh, the least amount of privileges that you need to give it and create it to expire like those are yep. those are two real good security postures to to adopt and the one thing on top of that I'll note is that when you generate a token it displays once mm-hmm. so if you have to generate two you have to generate two if it if you miss it you close out the page just generate another because it's not gonna it's, it's not going to appear again um I feel like I've talked quite a bit on the roles, the users. There are two available ways to run, uh, well, two available output formats from the API. If you're stuck in the 90s, XML is available. Um, If you were more technically inclined from today's age, you're familiar with REST, JSON is also available, and we use the JSON format. Mm -hmm. And then there are... I included three popular API commands. If you are technically inclined and want to check those out, so I just link if, them right if, back. If if someone goes to check those out, what should they expect? Given that this is a CRUD interface, if you want to kind of expand on on given those Create. three commands, what 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 is CRUD really going For to the make API, available to API, them? API commands. Uh, essentially, with CRUD, you're creating a resource, you're updating resources, you're I mentioned it, reading resources and deleting them. So So basically with the jobs, what we do is create, we don't really go in and you can delete jobs. You can, I more or less call them canceling. You can cancel a job. We don't really wipe it from the record per se, but what you do is you would submit like a post request and you'd go in and all right, I'm going to start a run compositional role. And then that usually pops back out in execution, which is why I include included the execution as the next one there from the execution. What you can do is then just read all the output from that, which is what we do on your portal instances when stuff's kind of going wrong uh you want output from a certain data point you want to see what services are healthy what's not the executions where you get all that information you're on the job it gives you an execution you pull from the execution all of that now all of this is under a project of course so you're gonna have to you have to scope it right at some point you have to say all right well where's the job and most of it's uuids but the project you have to include there as a, hey, I want to go to the R-Compose project slash I want to do run a compositional role or get the health check as a job. And then from there, you grab the executions. So I included these three. They are definitely the three that I use the most just because jobs are so prevalent in run deck execution is just going to give you all that data from the output. And then a project is really just that base kind of starting point from, all right, what, what do I have available to me? And, and like we've been harping on, I mean, this is kind of the documentation of how we use the service. There's, there's a lot more to Rundeck and its API. Um, it is obviously, uh, as, as we've said before, a project that's written on top of its API. It's a front end written totally. on top of its API. Uh, so totally. almost anything that you can do with, with Rundeck, you'll, you'll be able to do with the API. Uh, as well, and and that's what we like to see too. I mean, we we like to uh, give ourselves the ability to create the runners, you know. And I, I know that's not something we've talked about on the podcast a whole lot, right? But scripts that we write uh, usually are going to be interacting with the, an API of some sort. Um, so if if you're you know not one of the technically inclined or you know technologically oh, you can't say it like savvy that, people yeah, yeah. you know if if you just want something done if 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 you're looking and and say hey i have this thing that i do five times a week right and we can go talk about tech debt but you know if 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 you're finding yourself doing something manual you think it could be automated right that's where we start looking at the api of a given project and say hey is this something that's scriptable is this you know is this a a a known input known output known execution state we can we can start working through the ability to to automate that you know 
seeing that we have this experience, right, with with going through and, and touching a lot of these APIs, right, that is that is certainly something that that we're available to. Now you can you can contact us through ourcompose.com. Um, that's going to be the the easiest place or. If you are having an instance with us, you know, shoot us an email. Uh, we have our, our support email or reach out to us um, however you best like to uh, to get in touch with us. Going forward uh, in the in the, the rest of the podcast, though, I, I wanted to, to kind of dial it back from a lot of the, the technical side of things uh, and just kind of relax in the holiday spirit, right, for as long as I can uh, because... Uh, in inevitably, I will have to bounce back from the holidays. Um, for me, that's that's right after the start of the year, after after next weekend, um, and I am dreading that. So I, I I put this together just to kind of personally talk through for me what does that look like. Uh, so so my situation right now is I am uh, taking this week off. Today's actually my birthday, uh, so I am I am. As as you could probably tell, I, I love doing this uh, so much so that I would I would do nothing else uh, on today other than this. Um, but after that, um, I will be uh, spending the New Year's celebrating and then coming back to work. And it always feels like, you know, it's a new year. It's a it's 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 a you know gung ho season. But what is the best way for me to attack this? And what's the best way for me to come back in my stride? Um, and, and I use that analogy because I, I see this as equivalent to jumping back into a workout s- uh, schedule after having taken a break, as I may or may not have done recently. Oops. Okay. And, and so it's like, well, how, how do you, how, how do you want to do this? Right. How, what is a realistic way to take a minimum viable action to get back into the swing of things right so so i'm going to reference back to what we talked about earlier and in, in, in far as uh, minimum viable actions and say the the first thing you want to do is is actually start doing it right and and whatever it is so if i'm talking about a workout you know i i do want to get myself out there and and actually work out working out again right um if it's getting back into work i need to you know sit myself down and and look at my board and and figure out stuff to do um so that's that's obviously step number one is is to kind of prep yourself to get yourself into that i think in the article they say you know if you are uh, going to the well, if if one of your your actions is to go to the gym, the minimum viable action would be to, you know, get get dressed up in gym clothes, get in the car, turn the car I on. I loved that. I saw that. I loved that. I thought that was hilarious. And that's because the end of it. Because you're gonna it, look like yeah, yeah. You can deliver the punchline on it. I, I love this one. Yeah. Yeah, because because if if you walk back inside after having done that, you'll look like an idiot. So you might as well just go work out. So. So we, we, we understand the, the notion of minimum viable action. Okay, so, but how do you make sure you don't stay in that state of, of minimum viable action, right? Uh, especially getting into something that you've already been good at because, you know, I'm, I'm knocking off these tasks, you know, in, in, in October, November, early December, right? I'm just kind of churning through these things because I have a, a lot of working time, right? You know, having, having meetings with people, I'm used to my meeting cadence, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going from, from conversation to conversation to literally for two and a half weeks, not talking to anyone at work. Right. So, so how do you get back into the swing of things? Um, the first thing I wanted to, to th- touch on is, is, you know, what, what is skippable versus what is unskippable? So I have my workout schedule. Um, I basically have Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, right. Is, is kind of what I've been sticking to, um, where I've made mistakes in the past is to say, Oh no, I missed Monday. I now have to squeeze four days of a workout into the last four days of the week, right? That sure. is a recipe for disaster, right? Um, specifically with with that, um, you know, or, or, or sometimes I've made the excuse, okay, well, I can skip Monday, but like I want to go for an extra run and I'm going to do that on Saturday, right? And, and that just leads to overtraining, right? Your body has this great mechanism where it forces you to take time off 
you know, and if you don't do it intelligently, it will, it will, you know, it, it, it will insist upon it and it will, it will make you take weeks off if you push it too hard. So having, having learned from that, right, the, the trust you have to put in your schedule is to say, I trust that if I come back on a Friday, right, and I, I work out on my Friday and I know I have Saturday and Sunday off. I'm not going to try to cram extra workouts in those days, right? But I'm going to trust that, all right, fine. A- at least I got Friday, right? I-, I got my butt in the car and dressed and I, I you know, went to the gym to avoid, you know, uh, avoid being made fun of. But I'm going to give those days of rest, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take those days of rest and I'm going to come back Monday refreshed, ready to go and ready to to be on my schedule right there is there's nothing worse you can do is to than to than to try to over over engineer yourself into i'm going to get the same amount of workout every week right because because you're not it's it's, life happens right yeah so i'm going to come back you know if i come back on tuesday i'll do tuesday uh, i'll skip wednesday and i'll do thursday and friday if i come back friday I'll, i'll i'll start friday i'll skip Saturday and Sunday is my rest days, and then I'll, I'll come back Monday. I mean, I'm I'm trusting the system that that I know works for me, right? Because I, I I can sustain that, and and having taken a break, come back into that, right? Now we see that a lot with uh, meetings, with maintenance tasks, um, and and a lot of the things that aren't super important when it comes to to our work, right? But what, what about the things that, that are unskippable? What about the tasks that make up our pillars for Q4, right? About what, what about the, the bigger projects, right? How do you get back into the swing of those things? Um, and, and that's where I, I kind of wanted to have a conversation on Kanban versus calendar. Um, not before having seen how alliterative that was, um, just realizing that right now, but Kanban versus calendar, how do we how do we approach what goes on what uh and i think uh, the 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 beauty of a kanban system is its ability to call out unskippable tasks for sure. instance uh laundry for me is an unskippable task and and yes i'm a nerd i'm a board nerd i have everything in boards even my laundry schedule so if i see that you know i'm i, I need to do laundry today uh, it's it's not necessarily a task I need to do immediately. Usually, I give myself a, a buffer period, right? Because because I'll schedule it, you know, every week or for other things every two weeks, um, and 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 go through that cycle. But if I miss a day, I can't pick it up in two weeks because I will have no clean underwear by that time. I must do my laundry within sure. that buffer period. Totally. So, so the the board system, a, a, a board system, whether that be Kanban or something else, will will drop that task uh, into your into your whip or into your planning or, or or what have you. But it will it will show that to you and say, um, I know this is overdue, Andrew. By the way, uh, y- you still need to complete this. Y- y- you can't just skip this. Yeah. So then I then I say, all right, all right I'll. Uh, go do my laundry and, 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 and off I am. And, and when it comes back around two weeks later, um, actually cam board is cool in that I can schedule it to say not from the first two weeks, but from like when I, when I actually did it that, that two weeks. So it's a, it's a rolling two week schedule instead of a set every month. It's the first and the 15th or whatever like that. It's, it's something that can, that can roll if I eat into some of that buffer time. Um, but it, it, it does force me to not skip that task, right? Another one is um, I record uh, who um, did the collections uh, at, at church, right? Yeah. So we want to make sure that, you know, people aren't being overburdened. So we just kind of want to maintain a record. And, and if we around. see someone, yeah. if we see someone's picked up the last, you know, three months worth of collections, let's say, ah, let's get someone else into the rotation here. Let's, let's make totally. sure that's a healthy rotation. And I don't care if that's done right after church. I don't care if that's done Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Really, as, as long as it's done before the next week, right, that's, that's fine. 
But I know that every time I'm going to be logging in my board, that's going to be sitting there waiting for me. And it's really simple to do. I, I, it's really just adding a line in an Excel spreadsheet. But I know that if it's not there for me, and if I schedule it on a calendar, say on Sunday, You're, yeah, I'm going to forget about it Sunday and come Monday, I'm going to be looking at my Monday calendar and Sunday calendar is going to be, it's, it's a thing of the Gone past, yesterday, literally. Yeah. So, so what, what is a board good for versus what is a calendar, specifically when we take a look at these two types of, of tasks with these, these skippable tasks and these, these unskippable tasks, right? Um, when, I'm, when I'm falling back into my meeting cadence, I, I fully expect those to be in my calendar, right? I, I want to have some kind of an external note-taking system because I'm not going to have tasks for those. I'm not going to have a place to take notes and follow up with a specific task or project in that because that would be one, it could be part of a bigger project, right? Which, which I would have other tasks to take notes in. Um, but it in itself should be on a calendar. That's something that's skippable and something I should be able to fall right back into. Um, something that's, that's unskippable are tasks that I left off that haven't been completed updates, upgrades, uh, what, what have you, right? So those would need to be caught up on, right? And, and we want to mentally separate those uh, because if we treat either one of them in an incorrect manner, we over, over uh, burden ourselves, right? We, we have a mental burden and, and we say, I have to carry this all in my head. Oh, I need to remember that I've missed the past two weeks of this and I need to go catch up on it, right? Well, no, you, 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 need, to, you need to jump back into your, your meeting schedule and, and just continue forward, right? You need to jump into your laundry schedule and just continue forward, right? If I do end up three weeks back on my, my laundry schedule, that means I, I, I need to do it now. Right. Yeah. That's that's an that's an unskippable task. Right. Something that's that's skippable is is something that, uh, you know, up, updating our, our API keys. Right. That we, we have that that built in. We can we can do we can fall right back into that cadence. Right. Um, so. The. The work that I I don't want to get overwhelmed with is is looking at all of these tasks, figuring out that there are some that are, that I should just be falling back into the cadence of and worrying about the ones that I've missed, worrying about past um, meetings, worried about, you know, past um, maintenance yeah. tasks um, and, and, and making sure that I can fall in and, and not try to overwork myself on those to the detriment of the unskippable tasks or else I will have no tasks that get end up completed. So I don't know if that resonated at all. Um, that was just something that I was bouncing around in my head. I I'll tell you what though. I I do like the count. So you, I know you have the uh, you have a due date, right? Yeah. You have a due date on this the the uh, Kanban yeah. test. Now, yeah. do you have a time associated with those? What do you mean? Because at that point, like a t like say it. Do you have a it? Fine. It's due at seven thirty. Do you have a start ta a start time for those? I assume they move into like in progress on the certain day, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, day or days before, uh, it moves into a separate column, right? So okay. it, it moves into a visible column, right? Um, so I know that you and I move a lot of what we have in pending over into planned for the next upcoming yeah. weeks, yeah. right? Yeah. And then um, it moves to in progress automatically. Ex Some exactly. Of them do. Yeah. So so tricks like that. Um, are, are what I pull on my on my board uh, to to automatically have that indicated to me. Okay, so you, okay, I've got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, now, so that's also also uh, and and this gets interesting, but those those due dates that you mentioned, those are actually replicated to my own personal calendar. So I and that's have, what I was going to ask you. Yeah. I was going to ask you: Do you have either the start date or the due date? replicated somewhere maybe not blocked off mm -hmm. i wouldn't say blocked off but just something as like a hey by the way this is on your board right now or yeah and and that's the interesting point because if i had a start date then i would be av actively blocking off time to do that from my calendar which is which right. is a lie 
right? That that's right. that's not the time. It, you know, it may take me three hours, but it's not going to be the three hours before the due date, right? Right. right. It, it's it's going to be three hours in some kind of t- a, a, a time before that, some kind of a work time that I've set aside. You know, every day or you know three days a week or something like that. And 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 partially this this thought process, this this kind of trying to trying to make sense of this all kind of stem from this random article and I do not have a link to it, but you know, this is one of the ones I pulled up on my endless scrolling through Reddit and it, it was talking about why to do lists suck and why, you know, calendars yeah. are the only way to, to go about doing things. And, and they're like, well, if you don't have due dates then things don't get done, I'm like, well, boom, I already have due dates for all my, that's past, already on right? the board. Yeah. Um, right. Another thing they brought up though, is like the, the disparity that, you can feel when you don't get stuff accomplished, right? And I've tried to offset that with you and I when we talk about completed complexity, we talk about splitting up tasks, right? So I want my board to always be accurately representative of the work that got done, right? Yeah. I, I never want it to be, uh, yeah, but, or right. no except, Right. Right. It, it, it should always reveal to us the truth. Right. So so if we've gotten half of a task done, we move that half task. We, we split the task and move the half that we got done into done. Right. That gives us that sense of accomplishment, you know, and, and, and it shows visually that we've accomplished that. We can go back and reference it when we do these these podcasts, when we take a look at the developments. I say what got done. Well, we'll have this one task, but it's still worth talking about. So. If, if we have that, that kind of offsets it. Uh, the, the calendar crowd, though, said, you know, as long as you kind of stick to the schedule where you, you go in and do the work that you've set aside in these times, right, you can count that as a success, right? Uh, and Well, I was going to say with that, how do you – then you're getting into time estimation, right? You're not yeah. getting into complexity, complete, complexity completion because stuff – you might say a three, but that could – that varies, right? That might that now generally we have a pretty good idea for what that looks like, but mm-hmm. some three tasks are a lot different than other three tasks. Like there might be I and I think of, you know, programming versus editing the podcast, right? At the base level, you might say, "All right, it's a, a three complexity for writing a program." That might take me, you know, an hour versus the podcast to sit down and edit everything, right? It's an hour st- to start, right? It's yeah. an hour to start. You're starting in an hour and then you're going from there. Now, it's not very complex. It's not killing my brain doing everything, but it's a different three, com- they're different three complexities, which is kind of where on that calendar subject, I find it very hard to estimate, all right, do I give myself one hour to do this yeah. or do I give myself three yeah. hours to do this? And, and then you end up not making your, your due dates that you've set so far in the future, right? And, and blocking off the time. Now, now the argument to the to to the calendar crowd is that you know that way i don't have to feel like something is looming over my head when i'm taking free time right um i i can i can say you know i've put in my three hours of work i want to do on on any of my given r compose projects at at that time and fine but i'd say that get back get gets back to the board thing you can spend three hours diddling your thumbs saying this is work but is it done if it's not done if if you have one more thing to do it's not done right it could be 99 percent done and it's still not done which is kind of where i would argue against and and then then it becomes even worse because then you're sitting down with three hours ahead of you thinking oh how am i gonna procrastinate for three hours? what am i gonna do with this right and 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 having the ability to have you know a couple different tasks and whip and say you know what today I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna start this thing I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do the MBA on this one task maybe that doesn't get your motor revving right maybe that's the thing that just sucks today and you're like all right try it I'm spending not five minutes me. on it yep not for me I'm gonna move on to the next thing you move on to the next thing and then you're in that for four and a half and then it's like you know 11:30 at night and you're like where did the time go. <laughs> um, I actually kind of want to go over. There's a book called the Hacker, the Hacker Ethic, uh, which which has a, a interesting chapter on time. I might bring that up next. I might just dive into that chapter, and 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 that is where I got a lot of my early 
uh, inspiration from when it comes to time management, right? And and how work does not necessarily equal time, and and a lot of a lot of that argumentation. It takes what it takes, right? And and so the way to measure success is not in time. So figure out something else. And I, I think we've done a, a good job figuring out that that's something else, right? And we've been able to steadily march forward towards yeah. towards a, a a comprehensive suite of tools. Right, something that is going to be beneficial to people, some something that self hosters are going to want to sit down and say, "Hey, this is something that's pretty cool." Or, or people who don't necessarily want to self host, but you know, for for any of the other reasons, the you know, economical reasons, right? Uh, the 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 sustainability reasons, the uh, the political reasons. I, I I don't care why, right? If, if this is something you're into, I want to make sure that I'm putting out the best product, right? Not that I'm spending the appropriate amount of time working on it, right? Um, and and so I, I I think both you and I have a place to do that for, for our compose. Right. And I know that the, the broader open source ecosystem, that is the, the, the same mentality that I see there. Right. So, so as we, we, we kind of push this mentality forward, this, this, the standard of excellence, right. We want to be continuing to raise the bar and this is the way we raise the bar, right. With, with good habits like these, right. With, with the ability to, to see work rightly and to, to humanize it. Right to to say people need to see successes. People need to to get that kind of positive feedback, right? And and so I pledge to continue to to look in and and, and develop that strategy. If if you know if anyone's out there, and you're thinking, I I don't deal with people well, right? Or you know I have I've trouble getting myself motivated. Right. Or I, I don't I don't like the direction that we are heading in, who, whoever we is. Right. Whoever we is. That's a weird way to say that. What, whoever we is. We would be more than happy to sit down and say, we've we've worked through this stuff. We, we know the stuff pretty well. Let us listen to what you have to say and and come to an understanding of, of where you are so we can figure out where you need to be more than happy to do that. I, I set aside birthday birthday time to do this um, because it's it's what I love to do so if if you're out there and you don't love to do this I would be more than happy to, to ease that discussion but for the time being we hope you enjoyed this episode of our compose cast thank you be safe and we'll see you all in two weeks bye everybody <laughs>